Good morning. Welcome to worship here at Walnut Grove. I'm your pastor, Vincent Pontius. It is a delight to be worshiping with all of you this morning. I'm not normally a morning person, but today feels like a good one, right? I don't know. There's just some kind of energy to it. So with winter being over, there are several groups that are picking back up. So if you're part of the Mission Society or the prayer group or would like to be a part of either, they are back at it. Uh, if you were planning on getting your picture taken on the Make Up Picture Day for the directory, uh, you're one of like two people. <laughs> I don't think man, most of you must have gone the first time. So we went ahead. We're moving forward. You don't have to worry about that anymore. We're going to get that sucker done, and we're going to get it out to all of you. Um, we also have a guest from Russia joining us. A flyer is in your bulletin today. Feel free to give it to someone. Um, invite someone to join. It's not something you see every day, right? So I hope uh, you are as excited for our guests as I am. And we also have Katie here this morning to give us some announcement, partially about Food for Friends and partially, well, I'll let her tell you. Good morning, everyone. So to add to Vincent's uh, March 13th date that the Russian man is coming to speak at Walnut Grove, Food for Friends is going to have a spaghetti dinner for the whole entire church to come and be a part of. But one exception, only exception, is please RSVP. On the Welcome Center in the Narthex, there are slips of paper and the donation box. If you could just fill this out, put how many people are in your family that will be needing a meal, and just put it in the box so that they have a correct number of meals needed for that evening. So that's number one. Number two is we had such a great turnout for Operation Christmas Child last year. We sent over 60 boxes, which is amazing. Um, we did so good that now we are wanting to up our number to 100 boxes, and we need all of you. So um, every month we're going to give out a new item that you can bring in throughout that month that could help us get us to that number. So this month, for the month of March, we're doing stuffed animals. So easy. Easter stuff is out. If you guys want to stop and get a little stuffed animal to put in the donation box that will be located in, in the narthex. Thank you so much. Please stand for our call to worship. Beyond all question, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. He appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in glory. Our opening hymn is number 677. Let's 
Let's affirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed. Christian, in what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Have a seat. What would this community like to lift up in prayer this morning? I had the pleasure of going to Harden Northern Friday night, and I'm sure some of you were there also to witness The Little Mermaid. And the kids did such an awesome job, and the scenery is beautiful, the kids' costumes were gorgeous, the singing was good, and I'm so proud that Gio's one, and Anne Marie, I think you're another one, and Paul's one, and I think Peyton Cook is one. I think there's another one, but I'm not sure. Cody! Oh, gosh, how could I forget Cody? Uh, and Cody's in it. And if you have the opportunity, go this afternoon. It's, it's worth every penny of it. And I thank the kids for taking the time to do it, and the directors for taking the time to do it, and the parents for seeing that the kids got there. A big praise for so many among us being talented stars. I have a praise that I'm able to be back to church today. <laughs> Good to have you with us. I would just like to give thanks for family. Our dad is celebrating his 104th birthday in heaven today. And, you know, we've been studying in our 40 days through the Bible in our Sunday school class about David, and as great a guy as he was, and after God's own heart, he was an awful father. And I am just blessed and thankful that I was born into the family I was and the church family that I was. And just one last to bear with me, when you see Matthew's picture up there uh, in the army, um, just say a quick prayer for him. He, um, he's on the drug suppression team at Fort Bragg or Liberty, and he had a fentanyl death that he's investigating, and he's the lead investigator. So he gets into it. So just say a quick prayer for him, if you would. Thank you. I had the opportunity a few weeks ago to uh, give my daughter away in marriage, and I have a cousin who this next week will give his daughter away in marriage. So uh, just keep Mike McBride and, and his family, Michaela and Sean, her fiance, uh, in, in your prayers. Thank you. Right. And I'll also ask that we continue to keep in our prayers Judy and Kathy. Let's turn to the Lord. God Almighty, we pray that you would draw us close to one another. Help us to recognize the value that each of us bears. Help us to hold one another close, to recognize the preciousness of each and every person. God, we are so thankful to know one another, to have the opportunity to build one another up, to have the opportunity to recognize the Holy Spirit at work in one another, and to strive to help be a part of what you're doing in the world. God, you are merciful and you are good. You are ever giving ever blessing us. 
Help us to recognize your goodness, your mercy, and your peace. God, we pray for, for all those good things that you've given us. We're so thankful for the weddings in the McBride family. We're thankful for uh, the production of the Little Mermaid, for all the kids in the community, and especially in our church that participated and just did their absolute best, best to bring joy to, uh, to other people. We are thankful that Nina is with us this morning, able to worship you alongside us. We are so thankful for the church family that you've made us a part of. We are so thankful for the good relationships that you have given us, for the family members that support us. God, you are good, and your mercies pour out forever. We also pray for your help, for all those facing challenges, for those facing addictions. God, break that cycle. Help them to want more. Help them to fight and to find the right resources. God, we especially think about Matthew this morning as he works to do his absolute best in the position you've put him. Be with him and help him every step of the way. God, help us to be the light in the world. Help us to make a difference to each and every person we meet in bringing your gospel truth to life right before them. Now we pray as you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Amen. Would the ushers please come forward? God from whom all blessings flow. 
praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Lord Almighty, bless these gifts that they might bring you glory and aid your creation. In Jesus' name, amen. Kids, come on up. How's it going? Good. Good. How about you two? <laughs> Feeling good, I can see it. All right. So, have you ever heard someone, and this is a little bit of an odd expression for today, but trust me, it was trendy once upon a time. Have you heard someone say, oh, snap? Okay, you've heard it. Yeah, it means like, wow. That is something back when I was in high school, I started saying. And why did I start saying it? Because my friends were saying it. It was just a thing. I heard them say it, and I said, well, that seems pretty fun. And then I started using it. And just the other day, you know, here's another one. People just pick up things from their friends, don't they? Just little ways of saying things. For example, um, have you heard of the phrase, don't be a wet blanket? A wet blanket is someone that's being kind of a fun killer. Someone that's being a fun killer is a wet blanket. Uh, and me and my buddies sometimes use that to describe people that, that we are playing video games with that are not really getting into it. Ah, don't be a wet blanket. Well, just the other day, he told me, you know, I was talking to my boss, and he used the word wet blanket. I thought that was our thing. Where did he come up with that? It was not our thing. It's just a thing people say. I said it, and he picked it up from me, thinking it was just him and I that had this special little phrase. Nope. Just a thing. Just a thing that people sometimes say. You know, we pick up all kinds of phrases from other people, the people we're with, whether it be, oh, snap, or don't be a wet blanket, or whatever else, because the people we're with kind of help shape us. They make us what we are. They show us what's a normal thing to say, what's an exciting thing to say, what's cool, what's uncool. The people we're with make a big difference. That's one of the things we try to do in church, right? We try to build relationships so that the people around us can build us up. Just think about some of the ways that we try to create community. For example, this morning's Hospitality Sunday. So when church is over, you can go downstairs and you can grab a breakfast. And why do we have that? Is it because we are all really hungry and have no other way of getting food? No. No, we do it because we want to build relationships. We want to make those kinds of relationships where we learn how to speak from one another, the kinds of things to say and do to be good Christians. Um, that's why we study the Bible together. Yeah, you could technically do that on your own, sure. But when you're building relationships with other disciples, you can build each other up and strengthen each other. So think about the kind of relationships that you're making, the kinds of things you're picking up from people. Are they fun? Are they good? Are they going to make you a better person in the long run? Think about it. Let's say a little prayer together. God, help us to invest in good groups of people so that when we look around at how they're acting, and sometimes we pick up little things from them, there are things for your glory and our benefit. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, go have a seat. Good to see you. Our first scripture reading this morning is from the book of Acts. Go ahead and flip over those, open those Bibles to the book of Acts. You've heard this one a couple of times this year, but we're going we're gonna to talk about it one more time. This is Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 38. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, all for whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. 
They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our next hymn is number 702, Christ for the World We Sing. Christ for the world we sing, world to Christ we bring. second reading this morning is from the book of Hebrews. We're going to look at Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 beginning at verse 19. We're going to go out through verse 39. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open to us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that the faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as unholy the blood of the covenant that sanctified them, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, It is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. 
it is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Remember those earlier days after you had received the light, when you endured in a great conflict full of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecutions. At other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. And, but my righteous one will live by faith, and I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. Join me in prayer. God, open our minds and our hearts to your holy word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. A friend of mine spent their summer working with churches in Mali, which is dangerous. Mali is not a safe place. It's not a safe place for the average person. It's doubly not a safe place for Christians. That's legitimately a place where Islamic terrorists might attack you for being Christian. It was dangerous. I just thought that was really impressive of him. Uh, but you know, he was... Uh, always very noble about it. He would say, that's the kind of thing Christians over there face every day. The fact that I'm doing it for a summer is not particularly impressive. I mean, I'm going through an organization that does their best to try to keep me safe. Um, not everyone has those resources. Uh, we should be impressed by them. I'm not especially impressive. Um, and he had nothing but good to say about those churches in Mali. He said, those are churches that exist out of necessity. These are people that face so many challenges in their day-to-day -day lives. And when they come together, you can see these palpable bonds between one another. You can see that they care about one another, that they love each other, that they really genuinely want to continually build one another up. You can see that they know what they're up against. And so they all work together. And they worship with just this wild abandon. He had nothing but good to say. Uh, and actually, those communities were so strong that he was a part of that people from Mali continued to call him after he came back to the United States. He would occasionally get calls all the way from Christians in Mali. And, you know, if someone from Mali is calling, you pick up. <laughs> you don't know what they're doing, time zone differences and all that. So occasionally you'd be talking to him and he'd get a call and you'd just look down and say, oh, I, I have to take this. And let me just say, it was always hilarious to see him pick up a call <laughs> with someone from Mali on the other end. Because this guy, just a, a, a generic American white guy. I, I don't know, he sounded something like me, right? It, it just a, a pretty normal voice for his demographic until he picked up the phone with someone from Mali on the other side. You'd see him, he'd say, oh, hold on, I gotta take this. And he'd be walking away and you'd hear, hello, my brother, how are you? <laughs> What? That is not your voice, dude. That is not what you sound like. <laughs> you try to trick someone on the other side? And we would tease him mercilessly. Why did your voice drop three act octaves when you picked up the phone? And he would say, it's not something I think about. It's just, it's just what happens. You go there, and you meet everybody, and that's what they all sound like. And your brain just kind of switches something, and you start trying to sound like them. You don't think about it. It just happens. The other people that were there from other countries did the exact same thing. Um, and I get it. As much as I teased him, I get it. I, I spent some time working for churches in North Carolina. And you pop me down in North Carolina, you give me a couple of weeks, I'm going to start sounding like Andy Griffith. Um, and it's not an active thing, right? I don't sit down and go, hmm, what a calculated move. People have positive opinions about Andy Griffith. If I get a little bit of a twang, I bet they'll like it. Like, no, you, you just do it. You hear how other people sound, 
and it just kind of works its way into your mind and without even thinking, you start sounding like they do. Communities are powerful. They, they change not even only what we think, but how we present ourselves. That the words we say, the way we say them, communities make a massive difference. A massive difference. Um, and yet we live in an era in, in America where community uh, engagement is currently at its lowest. The definitive study that many people point to is by Robert Putnam, who, a sociologist that just started to notice the patterns of people going bowling. The more generations passed, the more bowling leagues shrank, and the more people were comfortable going bowling all by themselves. And so he just did this whole study across American culture and, and noticed that community engagement is incredibly low, just at a low point. Doesn't matter if the group is the PTO, doesn't matter if it's your, your local Elks Lodge, doesn't matter if it's a church, all that kind of thing, bowling leagues, all those kind of things are smaller than they've ever been and people on average belong to fewer of those, it, it, especially the younger people are. Uh, the value of community just seems not to have translated particularly well as time went on. It doesn't seem intuitive. And if communities help create us, you'd think maybe as we belong to fewer organizations, we would have more control over the kind of person that we are. To the contrary, we actually have less because when we join a community, a group of people that want to help form us, you know, we, we are joining a group of people that we know what the ideal is, we know what we are striving for, and we come alongside all these people that, that want to help us get there. When we bow out, that's just one less voice in our lives, one less factor that's going to help us become what we want to be. And there are always those voices that are going to speak into our lives regardless of whether or not we choose to participate in them. How many news corporations want to tell us how to feel about the latest global disaster? How many uh, shows is Hollywood beaming into our homes to tell us what it means to be a Christian and how we should be acting? Uh, how eager is YouTube to throw one more viral video in front of us uh, that is supposed to be the, exactly the kind of thing we want? Those are the kind of things we just consume without even thinking about it. All of that stuff forms us too. When we're not a part of intentional communities, these voices matter more. They are more impactful because there are fewer mitigating factors to stop their influence. And that is bad. Uh, by and large for Christians. Um, we spoke at, at the beginning of this series about statistically we are, we have reached a point where it is no longer normative to be a Christian in American culture, um, especially as you look at younger generations. The average as you move through life is that you turn out with no religion at all. That's just all things considered, that is the likely normative outcome not being religious. That's how the dominant culture forms us. So that's the way people will tend to turn out unless they're involved in other things that change that. The, the kinds of communities that might help people to become and stay strong Christians are not being engaged with as often. Not only is this bad news uh, for Christians at large, it's especially bad for mainline churches. Uh, now, what is a mainline church? It's those churches that are, you know, the socially acceptable ones. The ones you can tell anyone, regardless of their religious background, oh, I'm a, a member at this church. And they go, oh, that's nice. You know, they don't make a face. <laughs> it's just a normal, reasonable church. Uh, there tend not to be particularly strong uh, doctrinal positions on anything. It doesn't matter what you think. Just come and be a part of it. Uh, they tend to be wealthier on average than other denominations. They tend to have really large buildings. They tend to have really large uh, membership rosters. Just because it's just what you do. These are the normal churches. And historically, this is the kind of thing American culture churned out. If you were a normal American, 
you joined one of these churches, just what you did. Didn't matter if you were particularly devout, didn't matter if you weren't. You join one just to show that you were normal. Uh, a good example, of course, of a mainline church is the United Methodist Church. Like, that has all the hallmark, hallmarks of being a very distinctly mainline church. Um, tends to have an average salary that's higher than normal, has prestigious people that are a part of it, George Bush and Hillary Clinton, both United Methodists. No strong doctrinal positions, uh, and, and not really any strong disciple-making tools. It was just normal. Um, the membership rosters got so big because people just were a part of it, if only to show up on Christmas and Easter and show that they were the right kind of person. And I'm not saying all this to just randomly hate on the denomination we, we just got out of, right? That's not my goal. Um, I have no idea what they're up to these days. I'm saying it because that's our history. Like, we were there. We participated in these kind of social norms. This isn't to try to uh, shame anyone that, that we've moved on from. It's to really think about our own history. We were a part of this approach to discipleship where it was kind of assumed you don't really have to work that hard to get people to come to your church. Just be normal. Just be normal and wait for the normal people to show up, and they will show up. You don't have to do anything really crazy. Um, people will come. And increasing, these are the churches that are dying at the fastest rate because, again, when that's no longer the norm, where are your people coming from? <laughs> Nowhere. They're just not coming. Um, I think that's a real turning point, and, and I'm kind of glad in many ways that it happened. Kind of glad because, you know, challenging though it may be for some of these churches to recognize, oh man, people aren't coming like they used to. It, it's good for us to recognize that Jesus did not come to this earth to churn out normal people and create a safe, social institution for middle and upper middle class people to be comfortable. Like, that's not what Jesus came to do. He did not come to just uh, put a stamp on a, of approval on stuff that was normal. He did not die on the cross, gasping out his last breath saying, I just hope that people get their names on the membership roster. Like, no. Jesus came for so much more. He didn't come just to, to give a stamp of approval to what was already ordinary. He came to take the ordinary and make it extraordinary. Jesus came to forgive our sins, to give us grace, and to unleash the Holy Spirit on us, to build up a community of apostles that would go forward and start a movement to transform the world, to make things better, Edenic what God had longed for them to be. We can't be comfortable with just, just what's normal. Jesus didn't have any interest in it. We have to long for more. We have to long to become the kind of community that doesn't just wait for normal people to walk through the doors. We have to become a community that is vibrant, that builds one another up, that strengthens one another in the Holy Spirit and seeks those same things that the first apostles sought for the world. Yeah, ironically, Methodism may have worked its way to a normal sort of church, but that's not how it started. Like John Wesley was, was actually started Methodism as a response to normal sorts of average everyday churches. He, he grew up in the Church of England. His dad was a priest. And he saw it his whole life, all these people that were in the church, but they didn't really care. Like, they weren't really passionate. This was just the thing that was normal to do. They didn't have a relationship with Jesus. They weren't really interested in the scriptures. They just showed up a few times a year because it was normal. And it's good to be normal. And, and John thought to himself, what a waste. Why on earth would you waste your time doing something like that? When he got to undergrad, he went to this little school called Oxford. I don't know, some of you may have heard of it. Um, he went to Oxford, and when he got there, he desperately sought about trying to find ways to help Christians that were a part of the Church of England 
build one another up and live into greater levels of discipleship. He started a club called the Holiness Club. And the Holiness Club's whole goal was to be disciples that could impact the world. That's what they did. This was not for everybody. This was not just, oh, you know, normal people can swing by and see if they want to be a member. If you committed to the Holiness Club, you committed to regular discipleship in small groups that would study scripture. You committed to participation in classes so you could learn more. You committed to going to a church that had the kind of teacher at the helm that could teach you sound doctrine and build you up. All of this was involved if you wanted to be involved. This was a counterculture to a church that had given up its mantle. This was something intended not just to be ordinary, but to be extraordinary. And you know, it's the holiness club. You'll notice I haven't used the word Methodist yet. They, that, that's not what it started out as. It, it took some time. It was actually one of the things people came up with and started calling them. The first nickname they gave them was Bible Moths. So they were those lame people that were always reading their Bibles. And apparently that one didn't stick, so they used Methodist. And Methodist was an insult. Methodist was, it's something like, if you were to translate it from 17th century ease to modern American, it'd be something like the tryhards, the people that take their religion a little too seriously, those kind of Christians. It'd be something like that. Methodists, methodical about their religion. And I liked that. When people started calling them that, they said, yeah, you know, that is a pretty good name. We are those kind of Christians. We do take this seriously. This is important. And so they started being method. John was never shy about saying that, that churches needed to be countercultural epicenters that would build one another up to seek the Holy Spirit, to combat sin, and to make a difference in the world. He was intense, intense when it came to calling out just people that were just being normal. As a matter of fact, one of his first really famous sermons, he gave this sermon when he was, uh, he had received a scholarship. And people who received scholarships got the opportunity to give sermons every so often. Because again, if you remember the Church of England, it was just, it was societally normal for you to get the chance to give a sermon. Didn't really matter if you were very devout. Hey, you're a good student, you're pretty smart, go up there and say some smart guy things. That's enough. Um, John went up there and said some things, um, some things that were a little spicy. He gave this sermon called Scriptural Christ Christianity. I want you to imagine you're there, right? You are in the chapel at Oxford, and you see this young student come in. He's got a group of people with him. You know they're a little intense, and he gives this sermon on that passage from Acts that we read earlier, Acts chapter 2, this passage that talks about the church as it first emerged in Jerusalem. Uh, and we spent two weeks talking about this passage at the beginning of the year. Um, if you don't remember details, I encourage you to go back. I almost preached on it again today. But you, know, you only get so many Sundays in a year to spend three of them on the same passage. <laughs> Worthy though it may be, I opted against it. But incredible passage that talks about what Christian community is. John preached on that passage. And he spent time talking about how the church was this, this different thing from the world, a different thing from the barbarity of the Roman Empire, a thing that fought sin, that fought against Satan, this powerhouse. And he talked about the church through the ages, the way it endured, the way it built strong disciples in Jesus. And he got to today. And you'd expect, you know, if he was going to be a normal sort of student, he might have said something like, and you know, today we are a church in that same tradition. Let us build one another up. Ah, uh, no. <laughs> he took a, a definitively spicier position. Instead, he got to today and he looked around that chapel after saying all the great Christians of the past and he said, where can I find Christians like that today? Where can I find a place where everyone is filled with the Holy Spirit? Where are the people who have all, are all of one heart and mind? I mean, could you really call a place Christian if it didn't meet the description of a church that we find in Scripture? I mean, what can I say 
about the people I see here. Are, are you really Christian? Isn't it obvious that sin is going on all around you? There is obvious sin right here among us, sin that no one cares about, and that sin has consequences. Because of this sin, a lot of you are just a bunch of casuals. You're casual about God, you're casual about your relationships, and you're casual about your own soul. Almost none of you spends a single hour in prayer in a given week. Almost none of you think about God when you're going about your daily life. Does God inspire the way you're living at all? Are any of you familiar with the Holy Spirit in his work in your lives? You can't even tolerate a conversation about the Holy Spirit unless you're in church. If most of you stumbled across a conversation about the Holy Spirit out in the world, you'd assume the people talking were either hypocrites or fanatics. In God's name, what kind of, of religion are you participating in? It's not Christian. You won't talk about Christianity. What kind of place is this? <laughs> John did not get invited back to preach again. <laughs> He was intense. He was an intense guy because he really wanted to unleash the power of the church. He didn't just want to be a social institution coasting along, trying to approve some, some normal life on people. He wanted more. The answer to the world and the troubles it has is the church. The church is not supposed to be getting advice from the world on what normal is supposed to look like giving it its seal of approval. Um, and you know, there's so many places in Scripture we could look at. We could look at passages with Jesus choosing the apostles. We could see how the church was built, a la Acts chapter 2. But one that especially stood out to me uh, was Hebrews chapter 10. And this is a passage that shows us the virtue of Christian community, real Christian community, so well. You know, we've got here, Paul is speaking, um, And Paul, he's got this gift of being good at balancing theory and practice. And you always need both to be legitimate, right? You need theory and you need practice. If you just have practice and no theory, no knowledge about how the thing works, it's not going to be worth much. Trust me, I, I can guarantee you that. Sometimes my car breaks and I feel feisty that day. So I get down on the ground and I crawl down underneath it thinking, man, I'm so manly right now. And then I look up in that car and I look for things that might be dripping. And sometimes I find a little line of dripping stuff and I follow it up into the metal-y stuff that's in cars. And I go, ah, yes. I don't know what that is. <laughs> and I climb out and I call someone because I don't have any knowledge about cars. Not even a tiny little bit. I'm useless when it comes to I might feel like I'm interested in making a difference. I can't because I have no knowledge. Practice isn't enough. You need theory. And of course, you can also imagine someone that's got theory and no practice, right? You can imagine someone that spent their whole life reading books about how to fix cars, and they've never touched one. Would you want them working on your car? I wouldn't. You need both. You need someone who knows what they're talking about and has done it. You need someone with theory and practice. Now here in Hebrews chapter 10, midway through, Paul has just talked about the theory of Jesus, the knowledge of Jesus, what Jesus did and why it makes a difference. He has talked about how Jesus was the sacrifice that purified us all. You know, sin, God is a pure and holy God. He will not let sin stand. That would be unjust. And so someone has to pay the price. There's the sacrifice of animals historically. But Jesus came and delivered a better sacrifice, a sacrifice that impacts our souls, a sacrifice that lasts. Jesus was the sacrifice that will last for all of eternity. And not only that, he didn't just come and die for us, he also rose again for us. Because Jesus wasn't just a sacrifice, he was also the high priest. A high priest that stands at the side of God the Father and continues to mitigate that relationship for us. That's what a priest was in ancient Israel. It was the guy who could talk to God for you. And there was a curtain in the temple, in the tabernacle, that divided the holiest of holies from the average Joes. Because the average Joes were not holy enough to speak to God. You needed the priest. That was the middleman. Jesus went to heaven to be a permanent middleman for us. We don't need an earthly priest. We have someone 
who will talk to the Father on our behalf continually, someone that's listening to us to mitigate that relationship with God to continually keep it open for us. Jesus is, is both the sacrifice and the high priest. He has made us pure, and he has ensured that we can have a relationship with God. This is the core of Christianity, the death and resurrection of Christ. Right? That's the theory. That's what he talks about in the first few verses there, and then he gets to three takeaways. Three takeaways, because you believe this, the theory of Christianity, these are three things that you need to do, and they're building blocks. They all build on one another. Look at this. This is beginning in verse 22. This is where we get our first let us statement. Since we have a great priest over the house of God, since you know the theory, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. You know the truth about Jesus? All right. All right. You know that you're purified from sin. You know that you can be in relationship with God the Father, so do it. Live your life in a way that actually embraces the God you know you can be in relationship with. Look for him in the world. Speak to him. Listen for him. Be a person that doesn't just think about Christian things, but that lives a Christian life. Have logical practice to accompany that theory. But how do you do that? How do you assure yourself that you will continue to live a Christian life? Because keep in mind, these early days of Christianity, a lot of these people were new Christians. They had been Christian for a little while. But would they be Christian in five years? Would they be Christian in ten years? Would they still love God after they had endured even more persecutions for him? When things got hard, well, Paul encourages them to do just that. There in the next second let us, let us hold unswervingly to the faith we profess. He who promised is faithful. Don't just have a, a relationship with God because you're excited about it right now. Don't just have a relationship with God because it's new and it's fresh and it's exciting. Commit to God. Make this a regular part of your life. Continue to cling to God. And I think for a lot of us, you know, that might seem a little unapproachable. It sounds like something that's for those big moments of conversion, right? Cling to God if you're a new Christian and you need to, to actually commit. Or cling to God if you're feeling doubtful. Um, you know, make sure you're, you're sticking with God. I think this is something, though, that can apply in all kinds of moments. I mean... Even our moods can change the way we find hope in the world. Maybe you're in a good mood and you're crushing it and you're reading your Bible one day and you're up on your scripture reading, but then you have a bad day and you're feeling rotten. And you think to yourselves, there is no hope in this world. I'm not praying today. I'm not reading scripture. I, I don't want to spend time on that. I just want to spend some time feeling sorry for myself. Like, cling to God as your hope, not just when your mood is good, but when your mood is bad. And when the days are something in between, cling to God and make him your hope in every circumstance. Don't ever let go of him. So he's encouraged us to live a Christian life, to commit to that Christian life forever, to ensure that God's a part of it. And how are we going to do that? Right? How will we be able to commit in such an intense way? Well, he tells us this is the third let us. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. You want to commit to God? Get involved in a community where other people are going to hold you accountable, where they'll spur you on, where they'll encourage you. You know, if the purpose of the church was just worship of God alone, only an exclusively worship of God, that would be enough to justify its existence. What is more important than the worship of God, the God that made us, the God that loves us, the God that takes care of us? If that was all the church was for, was knowing this being and worshiping him, that alone would justify it. But that's not all churches. It's a place where we encourage one another, where we build one another up, where we ensure that we can last the long haul in the Christian life. You know, a... Uh, a commentator named James Moffat wrote, an early Christian who attempted to live like a pious particle without the support of a community ran serious risks in an age where there was no public opinion to support him. A pious particle. I like that. I think sometimes people think that's, that's fine. They think, oh, yeah, 
you know, I'm just going to pull it off on my own. I'll pull it off on my own. I don't really need other people talking to me. I, I can be a Christian well enough. No, we need support. And I know to some degree it might sound like I'm preaching to the choir here, right? I'm talking to people who all came to church today. <laughs> but the pious particles in many ways, maybe, you know, maybe they're not engaged. I, I don't want to sound like I'm, I'm only saying that because I think that's the thing. Community is not just showing up to worship. Community is being open to relationship with one another. It is knowing in building one another up. It is forming one another in those ways that will make a lasting impact, that will unleash the Holy Spirit in our lives and allow us to really grow, grow in a way that will last. The answer to the challenges of the world is the church. And I think that is a profound challenge for us to live into as we move forward. You know, it, so many people look at churches today and see them as declining social institutions that have lost their power. They look at them and they think to themselves, eh, there is a place that once upon a time had power. There is a, an organization that used to be able to tell us how to live, how to do things. They had their hand in politics. They had their hand in everything. But now they have fallen. They are a little more than a husk of what they once were. We don't have to bow to them anymore. But you know what? I, I don't think real churches are, are this declining institution. They, real churches are just waking up. They are a dragon that is being awakened. A challenge has been made so clear. How do we become the kinds of communities where we can teach one another how to act like a Christian, how to think? a Christian, how to present ourselves as a Christian to the world around us. How do we become the vibrant communities we were made to be? How do we build one another up in the Holy Spirit to transform the world? That's the challenge we have to live into. Not just to be pious particles, not just to be people who are engaged, but to be people who have deep connections that can support one another for the long haul in ministry. I have no doubt that we can live into that challenge that John gave the first Methodist, the challenge that Jesus gave to the first disciples, that we can live as communities that can transform the world. Amen. If you'll stand for our final hymn, number 507. Sudden.
Go forth in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. And of course, downstairs, it's Hospitality Sunday, so enjoy. Sunday. You too. Thank you for sending me that information. Oh, yeah. I hope it was helpful. Yeah, I have a lot to try to figure out, try to figure out how it could work. So. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Well, best of luck. If there's anything else I can do, let me know. Right. Have a wonderful Sunday. Enjoy your Sunday. Live it up.